Luna here, and we're back in Oblivion this week asking, can we beat Oblivion with only poison damage? This is close to an alchemy-only run because we're also not allowed to use magicka, so we have to use potions for most buffs and healing. However, I'm reluctant to call any run a one-skill-only run in this game because it introduces a lot of room for debate. Athletics and acrobatics are used when we move and jump. There's also mercantile and security. So would an alchemy-only run require us to avoid lockpicking and trading? What about armor and shields? Defining poison damage only and no magicka is easier. There are a couple of allowances that make this run possible, and we'll get to those in a moment. But first... Thank you so much for all the subscriptions and comments. It helps the channel a ton, and knowing you guys are enjoying these videos encourages me to make more of them. Now let's get into the rules. We can only do poison damage. Minimal weapon damage is allowed, because the only way to use poisons in Oblivion is to apply them to a weapon. Damage from traps, falls, enemy infighting, and allies is allowed. Damage from conjures is not allowed. Spells that cause enemy infighting like frenzy are not allowed. We must use iron daggers, and we can only attack with them while they are poisoned or to apply a weakness to poison enchantment. We cannot increase our base strength or train the blade skill. We cannot use magicka. Shrines and powers that don't require magicka are allowed. Armor, shields, and non-damaging enchantments are allowed. No glitches, exploits, cheats, or gameplay mods. Official DLC is allowed. I looked into reverse pickpocketing, but in Oblivion that only works with items that have zero weight. We can't poison our fists, so we have to use a weapon. But we're going to use the worst one we can find. A rusty iron dagger. We can only attack while it's poisoned, or to use a weakness to poison enchantment. There are mandatory enemies that are immune to poison, so we have to either use enchantments or spells of weakness to poison, and using an enchanted weapon is the harder option. Until we get access to enchanting, we have to avoid undead, because we have no way of bypassing their immunity, and using enchanted weapons causes other issues we'll get into later. We can't increase base strength or train blade skill, because we don't want our weapon damage to increase. Our blade skill will go up, but it will increase slowly because we're only hitting enemies a few times. We're playing a red guard because they have good endurance and speed. They also have the adrenaline rush power, which fortifies health by 25 points and agility, endurance, speed, and strength by 50 points for one minute once per day. It's a good oh crap button. We keep it equipped so we don't accidentally cast a spell. I was going to pick the serpent birth sign. The in-game text calls its power a potent poison, but according to the wiki, it's affected by magic resistance, not poison resistance. This also applies to the Cobra's dance power from the Serpent Doomstone. They're functionally spells that deal raw magic damage, so they aren't valid for this run. Instead, we picked the Thief for our birth sign. The luck bonus is useful because in Oblivion, the strength of custom potions and poisons is determined by three things. Apparatuses, alchemy skill, and luck. Despite the alchemy skill being governed by intelligence, our intelligence has no impact on our potions or poisons. My save at the sewer exit had used healing spells, so we had to go through the tutorial again. For once, it was difficult because we could only run and loot. The adrenaline rush power saved us from the horde of goblins at the end of the Imperial subterrain. Granted, we probably wouldn't have needed it if I hadn't succumbed to my compulsion to loot everything. Past that, we could wait to get free healing, and the blades handled the combat. We create a custom class that specializes in stealth to increase acrobatics, sneak, mercantile, and light armor faster. Specializing in magic would have made alchemy increase faster, but we'll get to 100 in that skill regardless. We pick endurance and luck as our favorite attributes. For this run, they're the only useful attributes besides speed, which is a distant third. We pick alchemy as a major skill to boost it to apprentice level. We also pick mysticism and destruction. Those are very important because we can't increase them without training and we need them to be apprentice level. The other four skills don't matter much. We get sneak, light armor, mercantile, and armorer. Once we're out of the sewers, we head to the city of Skingrad because there are a lot of free ingredients and alchemy vendors there. First, we sell the loot from the tutorial and join the mages guild so we can borrow some novice alchemy apparatuses. We harvest ingredients from the nearby forest so we can improve our alchemy skill and get gold. And visit the sharp tooth goblins to grind heavy armor so our level up will have the maximum endurance increase. We switch to light armor afterwards. We're going to be weighed down with a ton of ingredients, potions, and poisons, and I don't want to try to lug around heavy armor on top of that. 
We level up to level two and get five speed and endurance and one luck. This gives us more health, helps us outrun enemies, and makes our potions slightly more powerful. We had to get to level two so we can get a Daedric Artifact later, but leveling further would only make things more difficult because the enemies would get more powerful. However, without leveling further, our options for obtaining better alchemy apparatuses are limited. There's a set of apprentice apparatuses that's available regardless of our level in Fathis Arryn's Tower. To get them, we have to sneak through the castle in Breville to the Breville Wizard's Grotto, or find a trapdoor into the grotto at the bottom of the Nibbin Bay. Ingredients for water breathing potions are close by. There's red kelp outside the portal to the Shivering Isles, and some swamp tentacles are just inside the portal. Once we have our water breathing potions, we start looking for the trapdoor. The bay is pretty big, so even with the wiki giving us a good idea of where to look, it takes a lot of swimming and checking the local map to find the trapdoor. Inside the grotto, we had to contend with the giant slaughterfish. At high levels, it's a monster, but at level two, it's all bark and no bite. We make it through the grotto and into the tower with the apparatuses. However, the loot here is owned by Fathis Arryn, so taking it is considered stealing. This is probably because the tower is part of a Thieves' Guild quest, but it's irritating that items in a ruined conjurer lair are owned. What's blatantly BS is that the scamp throwing fire at us can report us for stealing. Why can't Bethesda get it through their thick skulls that Daedra, animals, and dragons shouldn't report crimes? We load back and take out the scamp before looting to avoid that nonsense. Now we have a full set of apprentice apparatuses. We can get a journeyman calcinator without leveling, but to get other journeyman apparatuses, we'd have to be at least level nine. They aren't worth it. Next, we need to enchant our dagger. We return to the Skingrad Mages Guild and purchase Weakness to Poison, Weakness to Fire, Weakness to Frost, Weakness to Shrock, and Soul Trap from Solanus Vassinus. These are the effects we'll need for the enchantment, and we need Apprentice Level Destruction and Mysticism to use those spells for enchanting, which is why we picked those as major skills. We also need a filled Grand Soul Gem. At our level, no creatures with Grand Souls spawn. However, there are some filled Grand Soul Gems that are available from the start of the game. Two of them are in the lobby of the Arcane University. The lobby is open to the public, so gaining access to the rest of the university is not required. We had to be careful not to get caught picking the lock to the display case, but the gems are owned by the Mages Guild, which we're part of. So once the case is open, we're free to take them. With them and the Mage Tallow Candles to restore our enchanting altar, we can enchant our dagger. We enchant it with 100% weakness to poison and 26% weakness to frost, fire, and shock, all for three seconds. We can make poisons that deal fire, frost, and shock damage, so elemental weaknesses can help us. We also add a 14 second soul trap effect to help us keep the enchantment charged. However, due to some weirdness at best and idiocy at worst on Bethesda's part, this enchantment will not help us until I figure out how weakness effects work later in the run. I'll explain soon, but for now know that the weaknesses aren't helping us. Luckily, one of the Daedric quests we can do at level two is Azura's. Her artifact, Azura Star, is a reusable Grand Soul Gem, and it will make keeping our dagger charged much easier. Travel to the gutted mine. The door will open to you. Bring the peace of death to my followers, and you shall earn my gratitude. We make some poisons that deal fire damage to make taking out the vampires easier and head into the mine they're sealed up in. Unlike other undead, vampires have no resistance to poison, so our poisons work even though the weakness to poison enchantment isn't affecting them. To be honest, I wish they were immune to poison because I would have noticed the enchantment wasn't working much sooner. We returned to Azura and got our infinite enchantment battery. Now we need to get our last apparatus, the Journeyman Calcinator. The Calcinator is arguably the most important apparatus for this run because it increases the duration of potions and poisons. 
The retort only affects potions. The mortar and pestle's effect on magnitude is minor, and the Alembic is buggy, but still good at apprentice level or higher, I think. The journeyman calcinator is in the Duke of Mania's private quarters, which means we have to get past the gatekeeper. While Jared Ice Veins could help us out again, I'm only going to recruit him if it's necessary. If we can reasonably take out the gatekeeper within our rule set, we will do so. This time, we take advantage of the other way of making the gatekeeper fight easier, Romina's Tears. Romina, the creator of the gatekeeper, visits the gatekeeper around midnight. The visit makes her teary-eyed because the creature reminds her of Sheagorath. Yeah, it gets weird, that's all I'm going to say. She drops a rag we can wring out for three vials of her tears. They're poisons, so they're valid for this run. The tears disrupt the magic holding the gatekeeper together, nullifying its regeneration for two minutes. With that and three poisons of damage health, the gatekeeper melts before our eyes. Next, we have to sneak into the Duke of Mania's private quarters. We can get most of the way without trespassing and only have to make it through the last area undetected. There's one guard to sneak past, but we have ingredients we can use to make invisibility potions. The motherwort sprigs and vampire dust we gathered during Azura's quest. Our invisibility ends when we grab the calcinator, but we drink another potion and walk right past the guard on the way out. With our apparatuses as powerful as they can be at level 2 and our dagger enchanted, we're ready to tackle the main quest. We drop the amulet off with Joffrey and head to Kavach to close our first Oblivion Gate. We run into stunted scamps and the occasional Dramora Churl. Far easier enemies than there would be even a few levels higher. The Sigil Keeper is, as usual, not much of an obstacle, so we grab the key we need, get to the top of the tower, and grab the Sigil Stone. With the gate closed, we get Martin to follow us back up to Joffrey, only to find out the Amulet of Kings has been stolen. We get Martin to cloud rule a temple so this beautiful and not at all janky scene can happen, and then we head to the Imperial City to find the culty books so we can get to the Mythic Dawn Shrine to reclaim the amulet. At least this time Boris can handle the enemies in the sewers, although he seems to have trouble finding them. He still blows the meeting with the sponsor, and despite fighting low-level enemies, Boris gets taken out at the very end of the fight. We grab the last book we need from the sponsor and find the glowing map that's right next to Green Emperor Way. With that information, we raid the Mythic Dawn Shrine. We stock up on plenty of potions and poisons beforehand because there are a lot of enemies and we need at least one vial of poison for each of them. We grab an iron dagger from one of the cultists because I was starting to suspect the enchantment wasn't working and that we'd need a second weapon. More on that soon. The time of cleansing is almost here! Ow. Oh. Glad you will not live to see the day, Lord Day. We snatch the Mysterium Xarxes that Mangar Cameron left behind and head back to Martin so he can start translating the ritual we need to open the portal to follow Mangar. Next, we need to give Martin a Daedric artifact. We could give him Azura Star, but we need it to keep the enchantment on our dagger charged, so we need to get a different artifact for him. At level 2, there's only one other Daedric quest we can do, Sheogorath's. We need to bring him a head of lettuce, a lesser soul gem, and some yarn to start the quest, all of which we found in the Mythic Dawn Shrine. Turns out Sheogorath has special dialogue depending on where we are in the Shivering Isles quest line. He's a bit nettled because we never talk to him after taking out the gatekeeper, but he still gives us his quest. Does my champion summon me? Before I've even told you what to do? Oh, well, that's not very champion -y, not at all. This is when I should smite you. Give you a serious smite, completely smitten. When I tell you to do something, I generally mean it! I suppose there's something I can have you do while you're here, though. A little errand, and a lot of fun. There's a little settlement called Border Watch. It's a nice, peaceful place. And dull, dull, dull! You're going to make their lives interesting. 
They're a superstitious bunch. Everything is an omen or a portent. Let's make one come true. Find their shop and ask about the Kashara prophecy. My great, great, great grandfather, Kishara, foretold of a time when we would receive three signs from the gods, signaling the end of the world. These are the signs as they were foretold. First, there is the plague of vermin. It is said our town will be overrun by disease carrying creatures. Rats, I would imagine. Horrible little things. I always keep a powerful rat poison around, in case I see one of the little monsters. Next is the plague of famine. It is foretold that our livestock will fall dead in their fields, with no apparent explanation. We have but the six sheep in our pasture, and we make sure they are well tended. The plague of fear? Uh, I will not speak of this. Not to any outsider. I'll answer anything else I can. Is there something more? Many are the evenings we spend around the cooking fire, sharing stories of elsewhere. The smell of our food travels for miles. She also has the finest collection of cheeses in the Empire. Her prized cheese has such a powerful aroma. She keeps it sealed in a case. The shaman of the nearby town of Border Watch gives us most of the information we need. We need to find rat poison to take out the town's livestock, fitting for this run, and we need to find something to lure in rats. There's a piece of cheese in a display case. That seems like a good lure. We take it and put it in the cook pot in the town square, and the smell draws in tons of rats. The shaman starts panicking and puts down rat poison, which we scoop up and take over to the feeding trough in the sheep fold. Once the sheep keel over, Shaogoroth instructs us to go into the center of town and wait. And duck. With that, he sends in the last of the three signs, which the shaman refused to tell us about. Apparently the sign is raining flaming dogs. With that, the townsfolk break down and flee in terror, and I can't blame them. We return to Sheogorath, and he gives us the Wabajack, a staff that will transform enemies it hits into random creatures. It's a fun item, but not a practical one, so it's a good artifact to give to Martin. Time to teach Captain Bird how to close Oblivion Gates. This time, Bird throws us a curveball by flinging himself off a sheer cliff into lava right before we make it into the Sigil Stone Tower. We can't fish him out, and unlike last time, he doesn't manage to get himself out. We reach the Sigil Stone, but we can't take the stone unless Bird is in the room with us. We go all the way back down, leave the gate, and fast travel to see if that resets his position. It doesn't. We were soft locked and had to reload and go through the Oblivion Gate with Bird all over again, including Bird's speech at the start of the gate. After beelining to the tower before Bird could fall into lava again, we get the Sigil Stone and close the gate. Somehow, this means Captain Bird will be able to handle future gates. At least we got useful ingredients. A lot of ingredients we can obtain in Oblivion Gates are good for poisons. Spittle sticks, scamp skin, and harada roots in particular. Daedric hearts are also good for restore health potions, so we've been able to keep ourselves stocked with the basics without wandering off to pick flowers. It's time to get the armor of Tiber Septum from Sancrator. This is the quest with mandatory enemies that are immune to poison, the undead blades. Even when they're deceased, the blades manage to get in the way. If we hit them with our enchanted dagger while it's poisoned, the poison won't work. Even if we hit them once without poison and then hit them again with poison, the enchantment being reapplied will cause the poison to be resisted. To poison them, we have to hit them with our enchanted dagger, then quickly switch to an unenchanted poison dagger and hit them with that. So every fight where we have to make the enchantment work turns into a cluster of weapon juggling. We can't switch weapons while attacking and sometimes for a few frames afterwards, so the juggling is lagged. I'm glad I made the weakness effects last three seconds because otherwise we wouldn't have had enough time to switch daggers. I wish I'd made them last four or five seconds, to be honest. We take out the undead blades, they dispel the magic barrier, and we grab the armor of Tiber Septum. 
Next, we need the Great Welkin Stone. We could grab it and run, but we allowed enchantments to get past Sankrator, so we might as well fight the undead enemies here too. The zombies are tough. They take multiple doses of poison to take out, and each one has to be set up with the enchanted dagger to non-enchanted poison dagger juggle. This can get frantic when there are several zombies after us at once, because we have to make sure we hit the same zombie with the right weapons in the right order during the three second weakness window, while the other zombies get in the way. The Lich is also immune to poison, but he was easier to deal with than his zombie minions. Now we need the Great Sigil Stone, and we have to keep Martin alive until the Great Gate in front of Bruma opens. At this level, we're mostly fighting scamps, so Martin and the militia do a good job of protecting themselves. Once we're in the Great Gate, we drink a potion of water walking so we can run across the lava, and with the help of the speed boost from Adrenaline Rush, we jump over some rubble to skip most of the obstacles on the way to the Sigil Stone Tower. We needed quite a few Restore Health potions along the way to deal with the lava damage. I know we could use hotkeyed potions to get around the four potion limit, but to me, that's too close to using an exploit for comfort, so we mostly drink potions in the inventory menu to avoid having over four active potions at a time. If we do drink potions with a hotkey, we only drink one or two. Once we're in the Sigil Stone Tower, it's simple enough to sprint to the top and take the Great Sigil Stone. Martin opens a portal to Mankar Cameron's Paradise so we can reclaim the Amulet of Kings. Once in paradise, we start picking every single flower and mushroom we see, mostly because I love the idea of Mankar Cameron fuming in his throne room because the champion of fate or whatever he calls us refuses to acknowledge him because we're too busy picking all the plants in his garden. Eventually, we run out of flowers to pick and battle the Dramora carrying the bands of the chosen we need to proceed. While the fire enchantment on his sword is as annoying as ever, he isn't a challenge. Also, this ascended immortal inside the caverns had a potion of cure poison that he did not use. Seriously, Mangar, this was one of your ascended. We make it out of the caverns, and after another 20 minutes of flower picking, we confront Mankar. We hit apprentice level blade skill on the first hit against him. Our blade skill goes up slowly from hitting enemies to use our poisons, but this was a hell of a moment for a pop up. Even the game is disrespecting Mankar at this point. And for good reason, because this is probably the easiest Mankar fight on the channel so far. We even stopped using our enchanted dagger to give him a chance, and he just kept trying to run away. We tried to mock him further by sitting on his throne as paradise crumbled around us, but sitting on the throne paralyzed us, so we appeared back in Tamriel on the floor. We're going to say that was part of the teleportation. Now we need to get Martin to the Temple of the One. Granted, after the last run, we know this part is almost impossible to fail if we run ahead to the temple. We're too late. Mayroom's Dagon is here. So with that, Martin turns into a dragon and ends the invasion, winning the run. I wish we'd been able to find a way around using the weakness to poison enchantment, but the only other solution to avoid the undead blades in Sancrator I found involved using an area of effect spell to knock the armor of Tiber Septum next to the barrier so we could pick it up through the barrier. In addition to breaking the no magicka use rule, that's a glitch in my opinion. If I have a choice between allowing a mechanic that doesn't directly break the rules or allowing a glitch, I'm probably going to allow the mechanic. I expected to spend more time searching for ingredients, but after the initial trip through the woods near Skingrad, we didn't go out of our way to collect ingredients unless we needed something specific like the water breathing potions. I also didn't expect to melt enemies like the Gatekeeper and Mangar Cameron so fast. In fact, this run might have been viable even if we had leveled up more and made the enemies more difficult. Overall, this turned out easier than I thought it would be, but I'm not complaining because IRL, we're only just finishing our move to a new place. Don't worry, I have a few more Oblivion runs planned that should be harder. See you guys next week.